Welcome to Spoiler Peace Theater, the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Megan Kearns. My pronouns are she, her. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. My name is Dave Riedel. I write about movies. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and my pronouns are he, him. And my name is Evan Crean. My pronouns are he, him. I am co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. Yes, you yes, are. Yes, you are. <laughs> so close. Jinx. We almost had it in I sync. Know. We should time it next time. <laughs> I know. We should. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> go. Three, two, one, contact. <laughs> so before we get into this week's episode, which I am super excited about because I have been off for two weeks, I was in sunny Florida, having a blast. Disneying it up, you. right? Disneying it up, you bet your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I missed you guys, and I missed all of Aww, you listeners, too. Aw, we missed you. Aw, thanks. But yeah, so I'm super pumped to talk about these movies this week. But before we get into that, if you're a patron, check out this week's Patreon exclusive bonus episode. We talk about our favorite car chases in films and car chase films. And it is an awesome, fun conversation. So definitely mm-hmm. you want to check that out. And if you're not a patron, consider joining and then you can listen to cool, fun bonus episodes like this. Yeah, one. we guarantee you there's at least one car chase in there you haven't heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I hadn't heard the one you you mentioned. Thank yeah. you. So. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Good times had by all. Yeah, yep. <laughs> And this show is going to be a blast, too, because this week we are talking about two movies, and I'm very excited because they're both women-directed movies. Woohoo! They are Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog and Lauren Hathaway's The Novice. So, let's kick things off with The Novice. Okay. Sure. Let's do it. All right. So, this is written and directed by Lauren Hathaway, starring Isabel Furman of The Orphan or just Orphan fame. Yeah. <laughs> I was psyched to see her in a movie again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's, yeah, she's been in quite a few things, but yes, but not as necessarily high profile. Um, but yes, so Isabel Furman plays Alex. She is a college student. She is a queer college student and she starts rowing and like rowing crew and she becomes obsessed with it to say the least. And yeah, that's what this film is about. Is It's about her drive and her striving to be the best and just pushing and pushing and pushing herself to some really disturbing places in mm-hmm. order to do that. So what did you guys think? A lot of, I love this shit out of this movie. Of row, there's a lot of rowing. <laughs> there is a lot of rowing. Um, I, I really liked it a lot. Yes. And Evan, you said you loved the shit out of this movie. Yeah, yes! I very much enjoyed it. <laughs> it's uh, it's un, it, it's unsettling. Like mm-hmm. th- the score is just so unsettling throughout. There's just lots of weird and uh, kind of disturbing imagery <laughs> involving <laughs> crabs and uh, was it crows or ravens? I always I can't tell the difference between the two. I always get them mixed up. But there were people with like birds' heads. <laughs> And lots of crowing sounds, like cawing. Yeah. yeah, lots of like weirdly repeating, uh, like obsessive repeating. Like when she learns in the beginning the kind of like crew rowing formula of legs, body, arms, arms, body, legs, and just hearing her repeat that over and over and over again in her head to the mm-hmm. point where you're just like, you can't even think. Yeah, I kind of like the fact that all of the the energy kind of gets sucked away from the I don't know what you would, he's not their coach, right? But the guy who's like, the bro guy who's like, yeah, and then you that's how you row. And then like, he's like, hey, calm down. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> no, he is their he coach. Is their he's coach. the novice coach. I beg you, yeah. That's right, right, right. <laughs> but yeah, but then they have the varsity coach who's the other person. But yes, he is the novice coach. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. I also kept worrying during that final, like, I don't know what you would call it, rowing battle? Like what? <laughs> like you guys know this is a thunderstorm, right? Uh. What? Well, they all keep telling her. I know. Like what? <laughs> and she's like, "Keep rowing." I know. I'm like, what are you? What are yeah. you doing here? So, yeah. And then it is interesting because then you see the crack of lightning like flash, and then it cuts to black, and I'm like, "Did she fucking die from a lightning yeah. strike?" 
I honestly, I assume that's where the movie was going because this movie, it just takes you down this road of obsession and you just think like, well, nothing good can come from this. Like there's so much self-destructive, so many self-destructive things have been happening to Alex's relationships with her teammates, with, you know, the, the other student that she's seeing the, um, Oh, Danny. Yes. Yeah. And then there's a, there's the whole thing with her hand that looks horribly infected and seems Mm -hmm. like she's probably gonna have to have it amputated. It's (laughs) it's so bleeding all over the road, like the oars and everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the scene where she, you know, engages in, in self harm and, and it's just so, you just think there's no way that this is going to have any kind of positive outcome. And I was shocked pleasantly that (laughs) she did not get struck by lightning and die because my thought was that she's going to beat whatever the record is that she's trying to beat. Then she's going to get struck by lightning and no (laughs) one is ever going to know that she beat that record. (laughs) Which feels very Black Swan-esque, which is interesting because that's how Lauren um, Hathaway described the film as whiplash meets Black Swan. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, which is, as I was watching it, I was like, oh, this is totally Black Swan. Like the obsession, the bodily harm, you know, the bodily control, kind of all of that. Yeah. I see the whiplash too with the, the damaged Mm -hmm. bloodied hand. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Yeah. Which is actually, yeah, which is really fitting too, because she worked on whiplash because her background is in sound mixing and engineering. Um, and, and not sound engineering, um, sound editing. And so it's funny that she's describing Whiplash when she worked on the sound in Whiplash. Um, but I think that's also really why the sound is so fascinating. Like the, like you were saying, Evan, Mm -hmm. um, the moment that there's sounds that are muffled, there's silence and interesting parts, there's songs that become distorted and the soundscape is really, really fascinating. In addition to the really striking visuals and the quick cut edits to really heighten, you know, tension and to show her anxiety and her state of mind and how she's really unraveling and becoming so toxic and obsessed with this. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's also really interesting too. So this is also a really personal story because Lauren Hathaway was a, an obsessive college rower. Um, She has said this in multiple interviews and I find that really fascinating. And she also said that she, because rowing is not very cinematic visually, it's very repetitive. She really had to think about how to make it interesting. And so she framed various scenes like a romantic love relationship, like very first time of meeting and the awkward first fumbling stages and then the honeymoon phase, which is why there's that sex scene that's cut with the water and the rowing crew too. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is to me, what I thought of when I was watching that scene was one of the showrunners uh, from Killing Eve and it could have been Phoebe Waller-Bridge. It might've been one of the later showrunners, but one of them talked about how there's such a fine line between obsession and sexual desire that the line gets blurred often. And that for me Mm -hmm. was what was happening is that she's having this moment of intimacy and pleasure, but all she can think about is, is rowing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Good good point. Thank you. Which is just like, Oh my God, like what is going on? (laughs) Oh, for sure. I mean, and then there's also like the added layer of like the metaphor of like the water and the (laughs) <laughs> big <laughs> splashes from the oars. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you guys, well, Dave, you liked it and Evan, you loved it. Cause I also thought it was fantastic. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I don't, it, it pleasantly surprised me. I was like, okay, I, I know this is a thriller. Like, I know it's about this, like, obsessive quest to go from being, you know, a novice rower to being on the varsity, no matter what. And I really was rooting for her, even though she had this like really self-destructive streak to her. And I just, I still wanted her to do well. And I, and I was like, so pleasantly surprised that she didn't die at the end (laughs) and that she kind of got to just like beat the record and then feel like she was done with it. So she could just like walk away from the, like that, that scene where she comes back in to the locker room and erases her name from the board and, and takes off her shirt so that people can kind of, people can see her scars and she can walk out proudly. Like, fuck you guys. I'm done with this. <laughs> well, it's also that was a really powerful last scene. 
It is. It is. It's also really interesting, too, because so often obsession when it's dealt with is not dealt with in kind of a mental health sphere. And this very clearly is because it's a very quick line that's really easy to miss. But in the fight with Danny, um, Alex says to her, um, she's like, I, you don't know anything about me. I wasn't at my high school graduation. So this, she had told Danny this story earlier about how there was this, you know, jerk guy. And after four tries, she finally beat him and uh, scholastically and how she became salutatorian and everyone was high-fiving her at the graduation because he was such a jerk. But that was all fabricated. And she said that she missed her graduation because she was 51 50 and that's involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital. And so she clearly has mental health issues and mental health struggles that she's been dealing with. And I really like that this film, it shows, like it utilizes horror elements and its score and its editing and its visuals to show how awful this is, but yet it also mm-hmm. is dealing with it in a very kind of grounded way. And I, I just really appreciated that. It, it just, it didn't feel like it was brushing the mental health elements aside. It didn't feel like it was being ableist. It just felt like it was showing us inside her world and her experiences. And I, I just think it's, it was really well done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't feel like it was in, in this kind of story, you could, it could be very easy to feel like it's judging her, especially kind of mm-hmm. as she becomes more and more obsessed. But the fact that she becomes so obsessed, she does what she needs to do and comes out on the other side and it's like ready to move on. I think, I think that was a really, um, I don't know. I, I feel like that was a really smart kind of sympathetic way to deal with it with the character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. I'll go along with that. <laughs> well, it's just like, I don't know. People on our team all turn on her because they're like, you're too obsessed. You're nuts. You're this, you're that. And then the fact that she can like say that she did what she set out to accomplish and, and, and just move on and walk away from all those people who, are frankly shitty people anyway. <laughs> That's true. We 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 haven't really talked about how shitty some of the other people are. I mean, she's obsessed or whatever, but everybody else is there's a lot of dicks in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Just people mm-hmm. being dicks. So But not everybody. No, not everybody. Is in this not film. everybody. But um No, I mean the 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 coach, the novice coach, both the coaches I think have her best interests at heart. Yes. And are, Actually, I was saying this last night after we saw it. It, it they they're they're against the kind of typical mold of coach, like yes. the asshole. I'm gonna push you so hard. It, it's refreshing to see coaches who try their best to encourage someone to have fun and yes. to not beat themselves over over mm-hmm. mistakes. Because, like over the many years that I've played sports, I've had a lot more coaches that fall into the like. I'm going to keep pushing you until you break and I'm going to, you know, be hard on you when you make a mistake. And it's just refreshing to have people who <laughs> are not like that. That the problem isn't mm-hmm. coming from the coach. It's like stemming from Alex and her like obsession. Right. <laughs> right. And and that is a nice, nice change of pace. Nice, nice twist to see. Yes. <laughs> I just actually, uh, you guys know that I reviewed like the fight camp app and all that stuff over the summer. And one of the things I like about it so much is none of the coaches yell at you. They're like, yeah. <laughs> all right. So like, there's no, like you can do it. There's nothing like that. It's just like, okay. And now we're going to go and just remember to get your form. And it's very like cool. And you just feel like, yeah, I want to do well. Cause they're nice. Not because they're fucking screaming at me. So <laughs> mm-hmm. I appreciated that from, especially from the novice coach who was just like, I, I just like to call him the hippie coach, but <laughs> <laughs> he is very like bro hippie. Yeah, like, hey, what are you? <laughs> no, we're just novice rowing. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought because he was like that, I was like, oh, this guy's going to be a major asshole or creep. And mm-hmm. no, he's not. No, he's, it was yeah. really surprising Neither. and refreshing. Totally. And that's the thing is that, I mean, I'm someone who's not in any way, shape, or form into sports, never have been, never was, don't really fully understand the appeal in many ways. But I know that a lot of people obviously do enjoy it. And what I, I mean, the thing of it is, is looking at it from an outside perspective, 
I would think, wouldn't you want someone who's more kind of like, yeah, just go out there and have fun and kind of nurturing and supportive and kind of supportive of you as a person and your whole life, like your scholastics, as well as your athletic abilities. Like that just sounds really Mm -hmm. refreshing and lovely. You would think so. (laughs) <laughs> yes. But I can tell you a lot of coaches come from a different from a different angle. Very true. In my mind, all coaches should be like Coach Taylor from Friday Night Lights. The Billy Bob version or the Kyle Chandler version? No. Kyle Chandler, come uh, on. Just I'm just asking questions. <laughs> no, I have the thought to come to my mind too, so I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kyle Chandler, always and forever. <laughs> Clear eyes, full hearts can't lose. But anyway, (laughs) but yeah, this is really interesting. I found this incredibly fascinating. It's so tense. And yeah, it's just a really interesting portrait of someone unraveling and alienating every single person in their life um, with their all-consuming desire to be the best, which is, and also there's a really, there's another an interesting element to it is that Alex says repeatedly throughout the film that she's not the best, she's not the smartest, but she works the hardest. And that really is interesting as well because it ties into the whole notion of capitalism and hustle culture and kind of all of that, which also kind of plays into um, the other student whose name is now eluding me, the student who's always like the other novice who's like always one step ahead of Alex and she needs the scholarship because she can't afford to go to college. And then her and Alex had that confrontation where she's like, you have a silver spoon in your mouth, just like all these other girls. And you don't even need this the way I do. And I just think it's really interesting because there's nothing, arguably there's nothing wrong with working hard, but at the same time, I'm also so anti-capitalism that it feels like almost cringy to be like, oh, you're killing yourself working so hard when you really shouldn't have to do that. So just it's raising a lot of interesting questions and themes. Yeah, Yeah, that 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 particular scene, that confrontation does raise some interesting issues because like, yeah, okay, she doesn't need the scholarship, but shouldn't she allow be able to. Shouldn't she be allowed to be on the team and to like pursue her goal of being the best? And if she is legitimately better than the other girl, like shouldn't she deserve to be on the team? <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. But then I also think of it from the other angle, from the <laughs> the girl who's financially challenged her angle of like, yeah, but if you're a rich kid, you have every opportunity handed to you pretty much. So It'd be nice to have a leg up. But but having said that, she, of course, should not have cheated or gotten the other crew mm-hmm. members to side against Alex. But then again, I'm also like, did she actually do that? I feel like she did. I, feel I like do she, too, she but, it's, but it is ambiguous. She said uh, she made that comment about you got to do whatever you, can, whatever you have to. Yeah, sometimes. that's true. <laughs> that is true. Mm. Well, I have nothing. I have so nothing I, else to add. <laughs> well, I have a question specifically for you, Dave. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, it's not bad. <laughs> well, it's for you too, Evan. But I know this is something that's a that's a sticking point for you, Dave. Do you think this film earned its breaking the fourth wall ending? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You know. Uh, I di- it didn't bother me. I do. Re- I I did think at the moment. I'm like, oh, breaking the fourth wall. But it didn't. It didn't make me want to murder anyone. So um, I don't. I don't know that it earned it. But there have been so many movies that end with this shot in the last four or five years that I just kind of feel like, well, this is just the thing people are doing now. It's funny you say that because I saw another film over the weekend that I had to review that is coming out on Friday and it ends the almost the same way too. Like it also like there's a, like one other brief scene after it, but it also has a breaking the fourth wall moment. And I'm like, oh, are all the movies doing this now? Because we have The Feast that does it. This other movie that's coming out does it. The Novice. So yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I Maybe I'm just used to it, but it, you know, I mean, it's, this is a good enough movie so that like it didn't, it didn't not earn it. Let me put it that way. I'll take it. What do you think, Evan? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good with it. I mean, I, I don't mind when a movie at the end breaks the fourth wall. I, I I don't love when movies are constantly breaking the fourth wall when it's not a Muppet movie. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. 
<laughs> Muppets get a pass, but everyone else, I don't like things that are like too winky at the audience. <laughs> Muppets will always and forever get a pass for everything, as they should. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, it's almost time to watch my new favorite Muppets Christmas Carol, but I digress. Mm. Ooh, yeah. It's a good one. But were, were you good with the, the fourth wall breaking or how did you feel about it? <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't think it was necessary, but I also didn't think it derailed the yeah. film by any means. Yeah, I was kind of like, oh, that's, a, it's funny, Dave. I had the same reaction. Like, oh, that's a thing that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> it was more like it was, it, it was just like, exactly. It wasn't, um, it yeah. wasn't a weird distraction. It was just kind of like, oh, they did that. You know? Yeah. And I think there's so many weird distortion-y things happening in the film that it almost kind of fit. Yes. I'll, I'll, um, stylistically. For sure. Yeah. yeah this, this movie has a lot of style going on. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. But no, I think this is just an incredibly well-made, sharp film. Really enjoyed it. Me too. Yay. All right. Do we have any final thoughts or is that it? No. Although I, I kind of want to pronounce it <laughs> no vice. The no vice and have it be about a person who has no vices, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> that's Jenny. She's the no vice. Oh, yeah. Dave. <laughs> I know. It's completely ridiculous. It is. On that note... We're going to talk about something that I'm so excited to talk about. I can't even contain it. We're going to be talking about Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog. Yay. So this is written and directed by Jane Campion. It's adapted from the novel by Thomas Savage, and it stars Benedict Cumberbatch, Kirsten Dunst, Jesse Plemons, and Cody Smith-McPhee. And it is a Western. It takes place in, I believe it's 1929, Montana. And Benedict Cumberbatch and Jesse Plemons are brothers. And they are both, they both come from an extremely wealthy family and they're both ranchers. And they come, they, they come to meet Kirsten Dunst, who is a widow, and her son, Cody Smith McPhee, who is very sensitive. He likes to make paper flowers. Um, mm -hmm. He likes to draw. And Kirsten Dunst and Jesse Plemons eventually have a very quick courtship and become married. And so they live with them on the ranch. And Benedict Cumberbatch's character proceeds to cruelly taunt them and terrorize them. And yeah, yeah as a giant we prick. <laughs> Yes. And as we learn, he's also a closeted gay man, which provides lots of interesting character development, lots of interesting confrontations of toxic masculinity and homophobia, both internalized and externally expressed. So what did you guys think? Evan? <laughs> oh, you're going to make me go I first, am. Dave? I mean, I could go first and just gush for yeah. the next like hour that I love this. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I want to. I want to hear why you love this, Megan. I'm not saying it in an accusatory way. I'm just saying like <laughs> I want to <laughs> tell. Tell me. Tell me why you're. Jack Hughes. I'm oh, sorry. Jack Hughes. <laughs> I just didn't want to dominate. I wanted to give the a chance for the for you guys to have the floor because trust me, on um, this one I could completely dominate the conversation. I mean, really, any conversation I could dominate, but especially this one. I mean, so straight out of the gate, Jane Campion is one of my favorite filmmakers. I've been waiting. I'm so excited that after 10 years, she finally has a new film. I love her work. It's so amazing. Bright Star and the Piano. Bright Star particularly is a fantastic film, one of my favorites. And The Piano is also incredible. I love the miniseries Top of the Lake. I love her work. So I was already really primed and excited to see this. And I found this riveting fascinating. I think it has gorgeous cinematography. Ari Wegner's cinematography is incredible. I love how mm -hmm. I love how expansive it is in the landscapes to show Montana, although it's actually filmed in New Zealand, but it looks like a pretty good Montana. And I love how when the characters are inside in the barn or the house or when they're in buildings, it feels very confining and it's much darker and characters are often framed in doorways to kind of show the constrictions of the domestic sphere as opposed to the supposed freedom of being outside. I love, like I said, I love the themes of toxic masculinity and showing how 
awful Benedict Cumberbatch's character is and how cruel he is. And he talks constantly about real men like Lewis and Clark. And he constantly taunts um, people like if they are effeminate or if they're not, you know, real men or if they're not masculine enough. He sensually rubs mud all over his naked body. And he's just embodying this archaic notion of a macho man that is extremely toxic and ridiculous and all in a way to distance himself from his own queer desire. And it's just, it's fascinating. And I love, I think the performances are amazing. I think Benedict Cumberbatch has never been better. I think this is his absolute best performance I've ever seen. It's incredibly layered and complex and riveting. I think Kirsten Dunst, who is always amazing, is amazing here as a woman who's unraveling and her drinking problem grows progressively worse, but she really wants the best for her son and wants to protect him, but also is in this battle of wits with Benedict Cumberbatch's character. Jesse Plemons is great. Cody Smith McPhee is great. He's really interesting because he starts off very gentle and seeming like he's really sensitive. And then maybe he's not. So what we think he is as the film progresses. I think the dialogue is incredible. I mean, I could just literally go on and on and on. I love the score. This is one of my favorite scores of the year. I mean, this was all score. It's such a good score. And it's this was all over my ballot. And it is my number two favorite film of the year. And it easily could have been my number one. It was it was a toss up between my top two films. I just I love this. I cannot say enough great things about this film. Sweet. Yeah, (laughs) I definitely there's definitely some overlap in terms of like I think the cinematography is amazing. It's really, Mm -hmm. it's really, it's a gorgeous looking film. The, the, the exterior, the interior, it all just looks really, really good. And the score is fantastic. It's extremely unsettling. It's just the kind of, kind of a typical Johnny Greenwood score, but in a good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's so, there's lots of like, like strumming, stringy kind of notes that just, they just give you this like foreboding sense throughout the movie. <laughs> oh my God. I was queasy the entire time, especially when Benedict Cumberbatch was on screen because of the score, but also because of him. Like, yeah, it's, it's very unsettling. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I didn't love this as much. I, I struggled to engage with the story. Um, I'm just trying to like articulate <laughs> what my issues were i could have definitely dealt with a little less uh animal dissection violence uh what what have you that was definitely a a turn off for me in parts of the movie yeah don't get me wrong me too i mean i would argue (laughs) most films are that unfortunately that way for me but i completely agree with you yeah that castration scene was a little much yeah that too um I found myself getting distracted by small things. And I think we've talked about this recently that like sometimes when you find yourself getting distracted by small things, it's not great. Like the scene where they're going to buy, they're going to like a general store and Cody Smith McPhee is looking at shoes and he picks up a a Converse (laughs) sneaker. And I was like, Oh, was that around then? (laughs) And then he'd end up in this whole Wikipedia rabbit hole about how in the 1920s, yes, Converse did exist. Mm -hmm. They did have high top shoes. So yes, he could have actually gone to a store and bought them, even though he ends up buying the kids. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think about that at all. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I I did, but I knew that. So it didn't bother me. (laughs) (laughs) I, I was... I was happy to see Adam Beach show up in the very tiniest of roles, and I wish I could have seen more of him. I know. Yeah, just because I like seeing him whenever he shows up. Um, one thing I did really like, though, was the... Would you call it the twist? Or when you find out basically w- what happens with his... Uh, with Phil's Benedict Cumberbatch's infected hand. Oh, that's a <laughs> twist! Yeah, I did. I did like that. Like, I kind of was feeling kind of like, meh, kind of like, uh, you know, like it was like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of like bored. But then when I got to the end, I was like, okay, this is this is a good what, twist. What's I the like twist this. with the infected hand? The twist so, is that Cody Smith McPhee intentionally poisoned him. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. With the infected cow the infec- yeah the he, anthrax yeah, infected with cow. the rope yes with the rope yeah 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 so anyway i liked that i thought that was a really entertaining kind of twist because it 
I don't know. I, it just some as I was realizing what happened as it happened, it was like, oh my god, he poisoned him. <laughs> but that's the brilliance of this film. There's so many tiny moments that seem just like tiny moments, and no, they're huge like that. They're just it's building to that crescendo. Oh, you guys right. are gonna be really yeah. upset with me. <laughs> uh I'm already upset know, with you. I don't no, know I'm how kidding. upset I'm going to be, Dave. I'm, I'm, kid- I'm already upset with you, but no, I'm kidding. I said I don't love the movie, but I mean, there's things about it that I respect. There, there are for things sure. about like, it. Most of the craftsmanship. Yeah, exactly. Most of the, like, um, uh, man, there, there's so many things about this movie that I think are genuinely great. Like, ben, I, I agree with you, Megan, that Benedict Cumberbatch is, he's just fucking magnetic in this performance. He's really... It's an unpredictable performance, which is like, yes! which is, um, yes. you can't really say that a lot about a lot of actors, but like, I really didn't know from moment to moment, even though I understood his character, mm-hmm. I didn't know what he was going to do moment to moment because um, there were parts where I was thinking, just how repressed is he? Is this going to come out in some way? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm so glad you said that because I think that's what part in part makes it, that performance so powerful. And that's why it's so unsettling yeah. because he's so wildly unpredictable and that's what makes him so dangerous. But yes, sorry, keep right. going. Mm-hmm. But yes, I agree with you. Um, and I, I agree that, that it's just such a beautiful looking movie. It's really stunning. Mm-hmm. The performances are all top notch. Even Cody Smith McPhee, who I'm, I've never been a big fan of, but I think he's kind of perfectly cast in this role. Mm -hmm. Um, but unfortunately, and, um, this will not surprise Evan. It probably won't surprise you either, Megan, from the moment, like when they're on that first cattle drive, when they're going, I think it's the first, like one of the first scenes in the movie. And there's that dead cow way off in the distance. And Phil says something to the effect of don't go near that. It could have been, you know, could have rabies, it could have anthrax. And I was like, ding, remember that moment. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's Chekhov's anthrax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, um, you know, I was kind of wondering where things were going. And then when Cody Smith McPhee uh, rode off by himself and then he puts on the gloves and he starts slicing into that, mm-hmm. into that cow, I was like, well, this is where this is going. And then just nothing mm-hmm. surprised me from that point on. So, which was... But does it have to surprise you to be good? Well, you know... Not necessarily, um, but I think because so much of the movie kind of hinges on that turn, um, and I just found myself waiting for it to happen, and then when it did happen, and it's also kind of like once you get there, once you realize what's going on, it's really telegraphed because he has that terrible wound in his hand, and then there are just so many scenes of him like, making that rope and you're just like well when is this when is it going to happen i'm just waiting for him to die now <laughs> and then right. and yeah. then you know when he when he's like sick in bed i'm like okay so how long before he's sick in bed until we're like oh it's the next scene and then then it happens like immediately like he's dead and it's like mm-hmm. oh okay right um and i love that he leaves the house to quote unquote go to the doctor and he's wearing what is obviously going to be his suit that he's gonna wear in his casket it's like you know he's leaving in his funeral suit yeah (laughs) so um i don't know i just that 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 was the big problem with it for me kind of once i figured out what was going on i was just kind of waiting for it to happen which is really strange i've i've um I've, I don't know if I've ever had that problem with a Jane Campion movie. I feel like she always has surprises me. Um, and then this, it didn't, it, it's not like I had expectations going in. Um, I actually didn't really know too much about this when we saw it, other than that, Megan, it came highly recommended from you. But, uh, and I was really looking forward to seeing it because, you know, it takes place in the West, takes place with people, you know, doing horse stuff or cowboy stuff, or whatever you want to call it. They actually call these cowboys cowboys. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's just it. It's just I kind of ran into the, you know, the plot machinations and sort of unraveled them myself. And then, you know, uh, which is not really the movie's fault. <laughs> but uh, uh, it did it did take <laughs> away from my enjoyment for it because I felt myself a lot of time being like, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Oh, it's finally happening. Oh, it's over. You know, so... Right. Yeah. It, there, There is this sense of foreboding of like something bad is going to happen. I was concerned that the the movie was going to be like, 
because because Phil Benedict Cumberbatch keeps saying to Peter like oh I want to take you out on a, a ride or whatever it's like we want to go off by ourselves and I was just so worried that was going to be like he's going to assault him and I'm just like oh my god I'm just not ready for that it just is going to be awful and I'm glad that didn't happen I'm like I'm glad the movie went the direction it went but I don't know I just I also think there's something Dave, you always love to use the word pat to describe things. I think there's something kind of pat to the idea of like this macho, toxic masculinity guy being very closeted. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's anything pat about it at all. Oh. Yeah. I, wow. I have a very different (laughs) take on it, I guess. Yeah, I just found like I found that just predictable. Like I, I was like, of course he's oh, gonna be. He's talking about this buffalo, you, you know, this buffalo Henry guy or whatever. Bronco his name Henry, is. Like, of Bronco course. Henry, <laughs> buffalo. Of course, that would be amazing though. <laughs> buffalo Henry does sound better than Bronco Henry. <laughs> it does. I don't know. I just I felt like that was predictable, and so when that the movie went down that road, I was like, oh, I'm disappointed. Well, the thing, but see, here's the thing. I'm sorry, I gotta jump in here because you guys are knocking the film for being predictable, which I don't agree with. First of all, because Dave, you actually said that Benedict Cumberbatch was surprising, and that that's a surprising I, his performance. His performance was yeah. surprising. Well, you didn't let me finish. So that you're saying that that's a surprising performance, so that's not predictable. So there you go, right there. And Evan, you didn't see the twist coming, so that's not predictable, right there. So all I'm saying is I hear what you guys are saying, but at the same time, I come at it from a very different angle because I didn't say that this all surprised me, but yet I still think it's a brilliantly crafted and constructed film. And even though it didn't surprise me per se, I still was just like, hey, I'm here along for the ride and I want to see what these characters do because it's fascinating. So I just think we're all coming at it from a different angle or you guys are coming at it from the same angle. I'm coming at it from a different angle where I don't mind if I can predict what happens. That does not lessen my enjoyment at all in any way, shape or form. You know what? And that's kind of the purpose of spoiler piece. Normally, like when movies are great and uh, it's the same reason you can watch your favorite movies a million times even though you even though you know what's going to happen i i just felt like for this probably because i saw it coming so early i was just there was a lot of time i was just waiting to see whether i was right you know so that's <laughs> that's partly that's on you know that's my fault really but um but i did really there were things that i really liked like i i you know the cinematography is great i think that uh, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch's performance is so large, not in a bad way, that like Jesse Plemons sort of gets overshadowed in all of the like accolades talk. I mean, he's just phenomenal with that mm-hmm. weird, with that weirdly repressed also, but not afraid of his brother kind of. I really, I really <laughs> liked how just like he wasn't afraid, of, like he knew what Phil was capable yes. of, but he just wasn't yep. afraid of him. Even when he was telling him, look, you got to wash up before you come to dinner. He was he was hesitating telling him that just because he's like he wasn't afraid that Phil was going to lash out at him. He just didn't want to like be lashed out at just because it's unpleasant, right. you know, <laughs> not because he was afraid yep. of him. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like that. And I thought Kirsten Dunst like kind of slowly I, I, I'm going to use the word hysteria, even though that's not really what's happening um, for slowly like becoming hysterical because Phil is driving her crazy um, because he's. Phil. Uh, yeah, he's gaslighting her through. Yeah, hell. exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, there was there was something that I was going to say that um, I I don't know. Anyway, it's um, yeah, it's it's fine. It's fine. The power of the dog is fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I I um I would never call it like bad. I mean, not even. I mean, it's a good movie, but it just didn't didn't work for me the way it did for you, Megan. That's fair. I wasn't expecting it to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, every, you know, it's going to work differently for everybody, even if we all loved it, you know, but, um, mm-hmm. right. Exactly. But, like, it's just, um, I don't know. It was really nice to see such a beautifully shot Western though. I will say that. I mean, you like, you, you want somebody like, um, rounding up those doggies in a pretty way, which this movie does. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I think this speaks to perhaps a larger issue as to why we watch movies and why we watch the, and you're right, Dave, like we watch movies over and over again. 
we we're not watching them for the surprise element. We're watching them for other things. And to me, the narrative in a film is almost always the least important part. Like, I don't really care. Like, I mean, sometimes I do, of course, and it depends. And on a lesser film, like you've said, Evan, and I completely agree with you on, you know, if, if a film doesn't work for you or if it's not as well crafted, you're going to notice and nitpick things. And that's for me mm-hmm. when I start nitpicking the narrative or nitpicking the predictability of something. But in a film like this, just for me, I'm just sitting back and I just want to watch what these characters are going to do. I just want to see everything unfold. It's kind of like seeing a jigsaw puzzle coming together. Like, you know what the final product is going to be, or maybe you don't, but it's how it all comes together that I that I want to see it. And so that's why that's one of the many reasons why this film is so fascinating to me. And also, I love Westerns as you all, as you both know, and I know you, Dave, you do too, but this really deconstructs the myth of the American West about, you know, cowboys and rugged individualism. And it really confronts that myth. And I love that film. I love this film even more for that. Mm. One of the things I like about deconstructing the cowboy myth is that, um, I like that this movie takes great pains to let you know that the reason, part of the reason this ranch is so successful is because they had a shitload of money already. Um, yes. which you don't yes. you don't get a lot of in the you know in the classic in quotes uh westerns it's like oh i've got a successful ranch well yeah you came from fucking oil money so of course you have a successful right. ranch <laughs> yeah yeah and i i do like the class commentary this this idea that you have you know uh Phil is like he's this Ivy League educated yes. guy who studied the classics and he rejected all that because he wants to, you know, work the land and have a rough and tumble kind of life while his brother is kind of like a little more on the business side, a little more on the like, I want to have the governor over for dinner and have our parents over for dinner and have nice, quiet <laughs> <laughs> dinners <laughs> with piano playing. It's, it is an interesting um it's an interesting comparison between the two brothers and how they both yeah. react to their kind of family money. And it's like, you know, Phil is like completely almost rejected it, but for the fact that, you know, he lives in the house and, and uses the family money for the business. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Georgie is more just like, yeah, I'm going to in- embrace all the creature comforts and uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> It's also interesting with with George, too, is that he's the kinder one. Like, he's kind and he's gentle and he's very tender with with Kirsten Dunst. And While also yeah. being slightly clueless at points, like the whole piano thing running throughout. Oh, that was awful. Yeah. I actually was- don't think he's as clueless, but I hear you. Oh, you. Th- My suspicion you- is not that he's that clueless. You think that he was just kind of pushing it, maybe not because he was clueless, but because he was, I see. Right. Yeah, I think he was trying to be supportive of her um, and just, yeah, mm-hmm. very, I think he's clueless in the sense of, no, you're just making things worse. But I don't think he was like clueless in maybe the way, like he wasn't aware of what was going on. Yeah, oh. he wasn't aware how much pressure he was putting I'll, on I'll her. Buy, right, I'll buy that. Right, 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 exactly. I'll buy that. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but it also could go either way. And that's, I think, what's really fascinating about that performance too, is that it could go either way and both ways would work, you know? Yeah. But but one of the most heartbreaking scenes, well, there's two, and they both involve um, Kirsten Dunst. I think one of the, the scene where she's like sitting by herself and like kind of looking down after she's really felt like an outcast in these conversations because they're all rich and they're all talking about like their travels and university and all of these things that she cannot relate to in any way, shape or form. And that's so tragic just looking at how lonely she looks in her solitude, but which also connects interestingly in the scene earlier when they're driving and they pull over um, into a meadow and they dance and she teaches him how to dance. And then he's like, this is so nice. It's nice not to be alone and to have someone. And it's like, Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. That was a nice scene. I mean, it was well done. Mm-hmm. I, cause one of those scenes where I was kind of like, if I was Kristen Dunst, he's like, Oh, it's so nice to be not alone. And then add something like, because you're wonderful, dear. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not just cause you're a warm not, body. Not just because, yeah, I finally, <laughs> you know, met somebody who like will put up with me. Right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of things to like, but ultimately it just uh, was ran a little 
strange to say use the phrase like ran a little short for me because it's like two hours and eight minutes or whatever. But um, it just came, it came <laughs> up short a little for me. There you go. That's what I'm trying. That's totally fair. I know I'm defending it super, super hard, but I respect your guys' opinions and I know not everything can work for everybody the same way. Even if you did love it, you, like you said earlier, Dave, it can't work the same way because, you know, two people are going to come in with two totally different feelings and experiences on it. So, yeah, right. I mean, and we also watch movies differently. Like we have different yes. things that we prioritize. For me, it, we were saying before about like, story like story tends to be more important to me in terms of like my enjoyment of the movie and so if i don't if i struggle to engage with the story or i struggle to engage with the characters then like even though i think the score is amazing and the cinematography is amazing and i think there are some interesting elements of the film i'm just not gonna feel as excited about it (laughs) wait you didn't engage with the characters that i find surprising yeah i mean I struggled to. I mean, I I I thought Benedict Cumberbatch was good. I don't think he was as great as as you guys thought. I I struggle with his believability uh, as a rough and tumble cowboy kind of guy, even though he is ultimately using that as kind of a mask. Um, I don't know. They're they're just. I don't know. I didn't engage with it in the same way. <laughs> mm, fascinating. Different strokes for different folks. <laughs> I know. I feel like I want to have another like hour long discussion finding out why. <laughs> I'm so intrigued because it, it is kind of an interesting casting decision. Um, Bilga Beery mentioned that too about how casting Benedict Cumberbatch in this role is very interesting because Benedict Cumberbatch is not the typical person who would fit this role. Um, but yeah, it totally worked for me. I found him riveting and terrifying and awful, but intriguing. Yeah. I don't know. I think that he could do just about anything. So, um, yeah, it, no, but, I do. But too. it was, it was nice to see him in a part that he has not done before at all. I mean, this is very yes. different territory for him. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Oh. Agreed. Well, I'm sorry that you guys didn't have the out of body, amazing experience <laughs> that I did. <laughs> I mean, it always makes me sad, but you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> so do we have any final thoughts on the film? Uh, stay away from anthrax infested cows, kids. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Especially if you have a big cut on your hand. And, and tend to your open wounds, please do not. Uh... <laughs> oh, and also, also. If you're with if you're with a kid, here's another thing. If you're with a kid who seems like he's meek and kind of like a weakling, but watch your back. But then he has no problem just snapping a rabbit's neck. Maybe watch your back. Exactly. You know. To be fair, Phil never saw that. Oh, he didn't see him snap the rabbit's neck. Okay. Mm, oh no, I apologize. He did. I'm he thinking did. of when he dissected the rabbit. Oh right, because yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's two dead two rabbits. dead rabbits. Yeah. No, I was thinking about. When yeah. Phil's like, oh, put it out of his misery. And then the kid's right, just right, like, right. okay, snap. And you're like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. There isn't a, I want to come back to the last thing I want to say is I want to come back to the, the talk about how alarming the animal cruelty is. It is. I don't want to make light of it and make it seem like, oh, this is a great movie. And so it's fine. No, this is a great movie, but the animal cruelty is absolutely brutal. I think for me, sometimes why. I want to say it doesn't phase me because it always phases me. But as a vegan watching films, people are doing kind of anti-animal things constantly on screen. So I'm kind of constantly bombarded with things that I'm like, oh, so yes, but it is nonetheless very disturbing. So be forewarned. You're going in yeah. that it is very jarring and alarming there, to see. There is a lot of that. And even though it is make believe, it is still gross. Yeah. It mm-hmm. really is. It's hard to watch. So, but yes. Okay. So, any final thoughts? There's that. No, that was that going to do I, it. That I guess that was my final thought. So now I'm done. <laughs> I let my favorite is the anthrax warning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Evan, I think I also love your tend to your open wounds. Or was that you, Dave? Now I don't. That know. was Evan. <laughs> yeah, I said that. <laughs> Thank you, Evan, because that also ties in with the novice too, because she doesn't tend to her open wounds either. <laughs> No, and I'm severely, I'm really worried about what happened to her after that movie, after the story was over. 
I hope she kept her hand. I hope that was all worth it. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually why she's quitting the crew team. She's like, she's gonna lose her hand. I came in first place, but now I have to have my hand amputated. So fuck it. You know? <laughs> oh, I love you guys. And this is why I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's recap. So the novice, the novice is in theaters and streaming on VOD. Would you guys say see it? For sure. Yep. I would as well. And The Power of the Dog. I know you guys didn't love it as much as I did, but would you recommend it? I I don't see why not. I don't think there's a reason to not watch it, you know? Even though it didn't work for me on every level. Mm Mm-hmm. Evan, what about you? Uh, I'm a little more lukewarm on it, but I mean, if you you follow Bafka and you saw that it won... (laughs) seven awards in our group you probably are curious to see it yeah that's true it sure did sweep oh speaking of awards that's something that our friend of the show and listener max coville from it's the pictures podcast mentioned on twitter to us was that uh the novice was nominated for a whole bunch of independent spirit awards so that is also up for awards consideration yeah sweet Mm -hmm. and the Power of the Dog, you can see on Netflix and in theaters as well. So we want to give a huge shout out and thank you to our amazing editor, Otto Clammer. Otto, thank you for everything you do for us week after week. You make us sound great. So thank you. Thank you, Otto. Thanks, Otto. You can find Spoiler Beast Theater anywhere you get podcasts. We are all over the place. You can also find us at our website, spoilerpeace.com. You can find us all over social media. We're at Spoiler Peace on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and TikTok. So come follow us, say hello, all those good things. And if you also want to get in touch with us via email, you can at spoilerpeace at gmail.com or you can call us at 86221peace. Leave us a voicemail message, text us, Whatever you like, tell us, yes, The Power of the Dog is amazing, or no, it is not amazing. I did not like it. Let us know your thoughts. We always love hearing from you. And if you like the show, please consider rating and reviewing us. That really helps us out, gets the word out about the show. You can go to ratethispodcast.com slash spoiler piece. You can also go to Apple Podcasts and rate us there. Helps us out tremendously. Indeed. And if you really... Sorry, I I broke in. Sorry. (laughs) That's okay. And if you really, really like the show, consider joining our Patreon if you're not already a member. This week, we talked about our favorite car chase scenes in film and favorite car chase films. It was a lot of fun. And we release weekly bonus episodes that you get access to as a Patreon member. And you also get to vote in monthly polls. And we're going to have a poll up very, very soon that you'll be able to vote in. So thank you to all of our patrons and thank you to all of our listeners. My name is Megan Kearns. I write for Edge Media Network and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. You can follow me on Twitter at Opinion S World and on Instagram and Letterboxd at The Opinion S. My name is Dave Riedel. I write about movies. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd as Dave Sees Movies. And my name is Evan Crean. I'm co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as Real Recon, and that's real as in film real. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll hope to see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.